Hello everyone and welcome to the Dutch Greybeard. I'd like to do a, my first review on this channel and it's going to be spoiler free. I'm going to be talking about the Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. Those are five very small books. I've just really finished reading these and the total page count of these five books is just over a thousand pages. So it might in fact as well be one chunk. The books were published from 1964 to 1968 and they were written for a younger audience. I like to read children's books now and then to immerse myself in that simple and innocent universe. Just to remind me that life still holds promise, no matter my own age. I will briefly talk about each of these uh, parts. First of all, the Book of Three. We follow the adventures of Taron of Ker Dalben. He's an assistant pig keeper who dreams of adventure. He's drawn into the world of grown-ups when he goes chasing after Henwen, the oracular pig he's taken care of. Along the way, he meets Prince Gwydion, the obligatory beautiful but feisty princess Island Wee, as well as the shaggy but good-natured creature Gurgi, and Fludur Flum, who is a bard and a king, and one of the most funniest characters in the whole stories. The fact that a lowly assistant pig keeper is on speaking terms with royalty requires no explanation whatsoever in any children's book. That goes as well for the fact that Taran, who wields a sword for the first time in his young life, escapes armed confrontations with seasoned soldiers unscathed. These highly unlikely twists in the story are simply not to be questioned. This would be different for adult fantasy books, of course, but as long as the reader can go along with these unwritten laws for children's books, there's a lot to enjoy in these chronicles. The adventure in part one, the Book of Three, takes Taran all the way to the other end of Prydain. Of course, there's an evil king, Aron, and Prince Gwydion is one of the good guys, with whom Taran very quickly develops a special friendship. Aran, the Death Lord and ruler of Anuvin, intends to conquer all of Prydain. This battle will be fought in the last part of this series. The character of Gurgi is a bit too much Gollum-like for my taste. Although lovable, he talks almost like Gollum does. Gurgi is mainly focused on food, which he calls scrunchings and munchings. This whole Prydain breathes Lord of the Rings, but that is understandable given their years of publication. The bard Fludur Flum, who is also the king of a small and forgotten kingdom, has a very special harp. Every time Fludur embellishes the truth of his own bravery a bit too much, one of his harp strings snaps, or more than one. The writer has given every character his or her own way of talking. Island Wee speaks in metaphors. This is expertly done. The story is very simple, good versus evil. The villains are straightaway villainous in their behavior and language, so there is no mistake in there. The events follow each other quickly, which can also be said for the covering of supposedly long distances. Still, the story is fascinating, partly thanks to the humor and the visual language. What I like most is the fairy tale like wisdom in these books. Taran grows up in the household of the old enchanter Dalban. He is 379 years old, not Taran, of course, but the old man Dalban. He urges Taran. In some cases, we learn more by looking for the answer to a question and not finding it than we do from learning the answer itself. A memorable passage is when Taran and his companions reach the hidden valley of Medwin. The gentle Medwin has respect for every living creature 
as long as they're animals. In the second book, The Black Cauldron, Taran and his friends set out on a quest to find and destroy the Black Cauldron. This artifact is used by Aaron, Lord of Death or Death Lord, to create the Cauldron Born, zombie warriors. For the first time, Taran gets to use his sword in real battle. But what he anticipates as a glorious occasion turns out to be hardly that. It is as one of his brothers in arms says, I have marched in many a battle host, but I have also planted seeds and reaped the harvest with my own hands. And I've learned there is greater honor in a field well ploughed than in a field steeped in blood. We also meet three, the three witches, Ordu, Orgoth and Orwen, who say about themselves, we are neither good nor evil, we're simply interested in things as they are. Almost all of the dialogue is in an archaic, courtly and cumbersome form of English, which of course gives the young reader a medieval feel. But every now and then it made me somewhat impatient, like, okay, get on with it already. On the other hand, there's enough content that deserves quoting. I'll leave it at just one example. The more we find to love, the more we add to the measure of our hearts. Part three of the book is The Castle of Lear, which tells about a mission to find and rescue Princess Islandwee, who has fallen into the hands of the evil queen Akron. This story introduces the clumsy and hapless prince Rune. I found this the least of all three, although still very delightful. Part four is called Taran Wanderer. And this story sees our hero on a quest to find his roots. It's obvious from the beginning that Taran's parentage remains a mystery. He secretly hopes that he is noble born, so that he can ask Princess Islandwee in marriage. At which Gurgi says, But kindly master is noble. Noble, generous and good to humble Gurgi. One of his other companions emphasizes about the people of the three comets, that's a group of villages under no rule of any lord or king. What matters in the three comets is the skill in a man's hand, not the blood in his veins. In the end, Taran understands, if I do find pride, I'll not find it in what I was or what I am, but in what I may become, not in my birth, but in myself. On his quest, Taran encounters several commoners in the free commots with various skills, a blacksmith and a weaver, he tries to learn their craft and turns out to be talented with iron and the loom, but it feels that their crafts is not meant for him. When he meets a highly skilled potter, Anla Clay Shaper, Tyron knows that this is his craft. But no matter how hard he practices with clay on the turning wheel, he doesn't reach mastery. When Tyron asks Anla, why the one skill he sought above all others is denied to him, the potter says, There are those who have laboured all their lives to gain the gift, striving until the end, only to find themselves mistaken. And those who had it born in them, yet never knew. Those who lost heart too soon. And those who should never have begun at all. So Tyrant's quest to find himself continues. This book, part four, is the most fairy tale like of the five and my favorite. Then the last part is called The High King. Sorry about the sun. But the closing book of this fivesome is no doubt the darkest of them all. It's about the battle for Pridane where several kingdoms join hands to try to defeat the death lord Aran. Also this book ties up the loose ends like the parentage of Taran. 
like our protagonist, the style and contents of the books develops and matures. This final book drags on a bit when Taran and his warriors try to overtake the army of the Cauldron Born. And the ending is a bit too much reminiscent of Tolkien's Grey Haven's ending. Although the writer thankfully makes a final twist and all comes nicely together. The closing words, when all is well that has ended well, are superb. I don't think I'm going to rate children's books. That would not be really fair compared to the ratings I give to the adult books I read. But I really, really enjoyed The Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to hit the subscribe button until we meet again at Dutch Greybeard.